I'm an avid hiker. Always have been. But I may have to rethink the way I hike after this incident. I've done a lot of hiking in my time. Appalachian Trail, backpacking through Europe. I've hiked trails in Mexico on the border and watched the lights of coyotes as they come to drop off their cargo. And in that time, I've never really felt like I was in danger. I've had some close calls, don't get me wrong, but... At no time did I ever wonder if I was going to live through these times or not. My last hike was the exception to that. I was hiking in the Midwest when I came across the most beautiful place I'd ever seen. I can't say exactly where I was. I was somewhere near the Kansas-Oklahoma border, though. What I was doing could easily have been classified as vagrancy, but I had the appropriate credentials, so any big-bellied Midwestern cop who stopped me, knew I was out here shooting photos for Natural World, a magazine that had requested some travel shots. It was pretty cool to get paid for what was essentially professional homelessness, and when I stumbled upon the little dell and saw the grass fields, I knew I'd found my photo op. The grass sat at the bottom of the little dip, and I thought at first that I'd found a bog or a marsh. When the ground turned out to be solid, I made my careful way through it, as I basked in the smell of wild hay and timothy. It was tall, the tips coming up over my head, and I let my hands slide delicately over the stalks as I walked through it. I was careful to keep my eyes peeled for snakes or any of the other biting or stinging insects that made a place like this their home. But I heard little beyond rustling as the residents took their leave of me. It was peaceful in the grass, and I lay down amidst it as I breathed in the heady aroma. I blinked a little longer than I meant to, I guess, because when I opened my eyes again, it was nearly pitch dark. I sat up, not sure what had happened. I'd never just fallen asleep like that before, and I was glad when I reached for my bag and found it was where I had left it. The flashlight showed me still within the womb of grass, and as I tried to orient myself, I found I had no clue which way I'd come in. The grass went from inviting by day to an aromatic trap by night, and the wind played games with my senses as it rustled the thick sheaves. I made my careful way through the thicket, the moon smiling at me from overhead in its grinning halfness. The stars were cold comfort as they winked down, and the longer I walked, the more certain I was that I was going in circles. The grass field hadn't been that large, an acre or two at the most, and as I walked in the unyielding straight line, I felt that I should have come out on the other side by now. Instead, I found a grass hut sitting in a small clearing. Calling it a hut may have not done it justice. It was a woven grass dome about ten by ten feet. The bands of grass expertly pushed through to create a curved dwelling that was likely to be dry. I could see smoke coming from the center, and I assumed there must be a little fire hole carved into it. The inside glowed slightly, like a furnace that's getting ready to go out, and the whole thing sat amidst a grass field that had been trampled flat. Whether by the feet of its inhabitants or not, I didn't know, but something about it looked a little spooky. It reminded me of the cannibal huts in the old Conan comics and I hope the comparison wasn't apt. Got yourself lost, son? I jumped a foot and nearly dropped my flashlight, turning to see a hunched figure about five feet to my left. It was impossible to tell if it was a man or a woman, and its voice sounded ancient, but not threatening. It was hardly four feet tall in its hunched-up state, and it looked to be wearing a very old blanket, in the fashion of a Mexican peasant in a western novel. The sleeves hung over its arms like a wizard's robe, and the feet that poked from beneath looked to be covered in woven grass sandals. He grinned up at me with his unoccupied mouth, his gums wet and pulled into a smile, and I had to stop myself from shuddering as the silence stretched on into rudeness. Sorry, you, you startled me, sir. Yeah, I, I must have stumbled into the grass here and lost my way. Any idea how I can get out? Just go that way and keep heading towards the sun at dawn, he said, hooking a thumb behind him. 
course, I guess it'll be a little hard till morning. Why don't you stay with me tonight? There's plenty of room in my little abode. I looked at the grass shack and then back at the little man. He'd startled me, but I decided there probably wasn't any harm in him. I agreed, and when he pressed on the side of the grass hut, I realized there was a door set expertly into the side of the hut. I had to marvel at the little creature's ingenuity as he showed me in, and the inside of the hut was no less impressive. The whole thing was set into the ground about five feet, and the roof extended down into the dirt walls. The smoke hole was the only opening to the sky, and the fire within burned cheerily. There was a pot sitting in the fire, and the contents made my mouth water a little bit. It smelled like meat and grain, and I imagined it was likely rabbit or squirrel, given the man's location. As I sat by the fire, I couldn't help but wonder how long it had taken him to craft something like this. The effort at work here would have taken weeks, if not months, and the end result was something truly spectacular. I made a mental note to get some pictures during the daytime, knowing the magazine would love to see it. So, what brings you this far into the grass field, he asked, taking the lid off the pot and stirring at it with a spoon. I was just hiking, I said, the warm interior making me feel sleepy all over again. I take pictures for magazines and write travel articles, and I sort of stumbled across your field on my way between places. The man ladled some of the pot's contents into a bowl, and as he handed it to me, I was amazed to see that it was also made of woven grass. He lifted a gourd jug to his lips and sipped before picking up his own bowl, and when he offered it to me, I found it was full of spring water. The bowl was full of stew. The meat went well with the roots and things he had mixed with it. It was a little bland, but filling, and he seemed to chew over what I had said as much as the meal. Taking pictures, eh? He finally said, the words a little muffled as he chewed at the gristle. Are you some sort of reporter? Not really. More like a journalist, I guess. I write articles for Natural World. It's a magazine for outdoorsmen and hikers and the like. The fella, I suppose that I had been thinking of him as a little old man in my head, nodded as he sipped at the broth of his soup. He was quiet for a little bit, the fire crackling between us, the only sound in the hut, before he asked his next question. What sort of stories do you write for your magazine? I had been crunching at some of the vegetables that hadn't been cooked all the way and swallowed them a little too hastily as he sent his next pondering at me. I coughed, reaching for the gourd as the water slopped down my face and managed to worry them down. The old man's ponderous way of talking and long bouts of silence were a little strange, but I found him to be an agreeable dinner host. <laughs> Usually local pieces, lore or tourist spots that the readers might be interested in. Beauty spots they might want to take in, interesting points of order in the area, local legends and things. Anything really to get people buying magazines. What about urban legends? he asked his smile returning as he lowered his bowl. The glint of firelight off his gums made the effect all the more grisly. I coughed again, but it had nothing to do with the remains of wild carrot and roots. <clears throat> Something, uh, if they're especially interesting. Readers always like a bit of local color, I admitted, like it might be a dirty secret. Well... It just so happens that the grass field you're sitting in is a little piece of local history. I could tell you about it, if you like. My excitement was at odds with my unease at this point. This was one of those situations that prickles that ancient part of your brain, the one that stopped your forebears from getting eaten by predators. That being said, the story was already starting to come together in my mind. Sitting in an honest-to-God hut and hearing a story by firelight, by a native no less, was the kind of things these stories were made of. To be living one was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity, and not one that I was going to pass up. My editor was going to absolutely have a fit when I sent him this, and I could already smell the bonus check. I'd love to. You, you don't mind if I use the story, do you? I'd be delighted. 
the old man said, and when he leaned forward, his wrinkled old face looked like a jack-o'-lantern in the dancing firelight. The hut took on a shadowy cast as his head blocked out some of the light, and the effect was impressive. This field was once called Fairy's Rest. It was said that on summer nights you could see the fireflies dancing through the stalks, and the travelers who witnessed it thought they must be fairies holding a revel. An old hermit lived out in this very field, in this very hut, in fact, and he acted as a sort of medicine man. He brewed cures for the most part, helping people who needed tonics and tinctures, and was well loved by the community. Some said he was a warlock, a trickster, who was in league with Satan, but the locals knew him to be a fine enough sort, and generally left him to his own pursuits. I found myself leaning in a little as he spoke, the smoke stinging my eyes some as it wafted up from the crackling depths of the fire. The little town of Maverick got a new preacher man one spring, and that was when the trouble started. The new preacher was one of those fire and brimstone sorts, a suffer not a witch to live disciples, who had set his sights on the old hermit for some reason. He chastised the people of Maverick, asking how they could claim to be godly while allowing an agent of Satan to live in their midst. He told them that God would surely punish them for their inaction if they continued to let him live so close to their town. But the people were not so quick to act. They didn't mind having the old man so close to town. Many of them benefited from it. But the preacher was persuasive. It took him some time, but he finally convinced them that the old man's very existence would spoil their relationship with God, and they made plans to go and oust him. As I listened, I found myself watching the shadows on the wall of the hut. In the dancing light of the fire, I could almost see the mob with their torches and pitchforks as they made their way to the grasslands to smoke out the poor old fellow. At their head was a man in a tall hat with a torch held aloft as he led them to their work. I wondered if maybe water was all that was in that gourd, but the old man's story had me hooked. Well, they came to the grassy patch, but no matter how much they searched or how deep they went, they couldn't find the hermit's house. It should have been impossible, but the longer they looked, the more furious the preacher became. He told them this was proof of the old man's misdeeds and that Satan himself must surely be hiding the old warlock. Finally, he took a torch and set the grass ablaze, sending smoke into the sky as it burned. They burned the patch flat down to the soil, and when it was done, they rode back to town triumphant. As he told the story, the smell of the fire was replaced with the acrid smell of a wildfire. I could just imagine someone trapped in that hellish blaze, their house burning around them as they sat inside, knowing there was no escape. Had the hermit tried to run through the burning grass? Had the smoke gotten him before the flames did? I coughed, reaching for the gourd again, and the old man seemed to revel in my discomfort. Well, imagine their surprise when the spot was reported to have returned a week later. They never found the old man, but it was said that smoke could be seen coming from the grass field. It was said that people had started going missing, too. Anyone who was involved in the burning either went missing themselves or saw a member of their family disappear. Most of the time... It was children, but sometimes a spouse or a cousin would suffice. Eventually, the people of Maverick told the preacher he wasn't welcome anymore and forced him out of town in the hopes the old man's spirit would be appeased. He sat back from the fire then, 
watching me as I leaned in closer, the fire hot against my face as I fell deeper into the tail. After that, they called this place ghost grass, and those who venture in sometimes never come out again. Travelers, hikers, local kids who don't heed their parents' warnings, they all fall victim to the ghost grass and the vengeful old soul who resides there. He doesn't take them all, though. He still leaves a few, the ones he let live so they might spread the story. Those who come here without invitation, however, learn better than to meddle with things outside their kin. The people of Maverick still remember, and they always will. I leaned back as he finished, letting the implications sink in. Was, was he claiming to be the vengeful spirit of the grassy field? Or was he just messing with me? Suddenly, I had never felt less tired in my life, but when he suggested that we turn in for the night, I agreed without argument. Where would I go, after all? The people who had come to find the old hermit had never discovered the place. What were the odds of me stumbling out again with, with only the moon to guide me? I lay in the shadows of the hut, the fire burning low as the old man lay on the opposite side. He never snuffled or tossed, just lay there like a stone as I shivered beneath my blanket. I didn't want to sleep, didn't want to drop off with this thing so close to me. But I felt my long day of hiking catching up with me. I fought against sleep, trying not to fall into the web, but eventually the matter was settled for me, and I came awake in the morning like a diver breaking the surface. The hut was dark, but I could see the sun through the smoke hole. The old man was nowhere to be found, and I saw little else to do but pack up my bedding and leave. I got some pictures, kind of wishing the old man was there so I could include him, and left the hut behind me. I found my way out of the grass, just as he had suggested, and after a single look back, I set off west, just as I had for the last week. The woods were far behind me, and the flat lands I found myself in were dotted with farms and fences, crops and cattle, and a dark snake that stretched its way across the ground as far as the eye could see. The road appeared once I broke the hills, and I followed it for most of the day. I saw a sign around noon that told me Maverick was two miles up the road, and when the outskirts came into view, I was glad to be back in civilization. I stopped at a local diner to write this down and send it to my editor, wanting to get it all out while it was still fresh. I don't know why I was worried about missing a detail, because I don't think any of the night before will ever leave my mind. The people of Maverick are very familiar with the grasslands and the legends that surround them. The woman at the Desert Flower Diner where I sit now shuddered when I told her about the night I'd had. She said I was lucky to be alive, luckier than Bill Register and his friends at least. When I asked who they were, she pointed to a bulletin board by the door. There hung three missing persons posters bearing the faces of three high school kids who had recently gone missing. Thinking about what meat might have been in that pot I ate makes my stomach flip, but suppose it's too late to regret now. So if you find yourself traveling the footpaths of Oklahoma and you come across a field of tall, lush grass, be very careful. They might hang your missing poster on that board, too, should you become the next victim of the ghost grass hermit. You're still here. I thought you might be. Thanks for joining me for tonight's story. If your insatiable appetite for horror knows no bounds, might I suggest one of our playlists, or one of our previous stories in the archive? There should be one appearing at the end of the story any minute now. And of course, if you're not subscribed, why not go ahead and hit that subscribe button? Maybe hit that notification bell, so you don't miss any of the spooky things that we do here. If you prefer your horror a little more analog, you can always pick up one of my books. There's a link below to my latest, and it'll take you to all the great things that I've posted on Amazon. 
For my book lovers in the audience, I always suggest coming on down to Patreon so you can become part of my ghostly reader tier and get a book anytime I write one, which is usually about twice a year. Speaking of my patrons, let's go ahead and thank them, shall we? Thanks to Unicorn Hollow for being our spooky ghost contributor. Thanks to Janet and Lady Vengeance for being our spooky skeleton tier contributors. Thanks to Hi Stacy, Winter, Zeronin, Emily Coltsfoot, Stephanie Carrington, Marianne Schuler, Tyler Parker, and Jennifer Damron for being our ghostly reader tier contributors. Thanks, everyone. We just couldn't do the show without you. If you think you might like to support the show in a more monetary fashion, come on down to Patreon. I have many tiers. I'm sure you'll find one that suits you best. I always recommend the Ghostly Reader tier, since you get a signed book anytime I write one on your doorstep. But I have many tiers, and again, I'm sure you'll find one to suit you. And as always, thanks for stopping by. Dr. Plague, signing off. Have a wonderful evening.